hands on your heart. Repeat after me. Say, Lord, open my heart to receive what I need from you. I'm stronger. I'm wiser. I'm better. So much better. Lord, give me the strength to deal with it. In Jesus' name, clap your hands. Sit down to all of you who are watching right now. Welcome to Rock City University. I pray in the name of Jesus, the Jesus that rose from the dead with all power in his hand, that matchless Savior, uh, the rose of Sharon, the heavy load bearer, that rock in a weary land, the shelter in a time of storm. Won't he do it? Won't he will? To that man, Jesus, man, that perfect Palestinian Jew named Jesus, I just pray that the glory of God rests on your life and you become all that God has called you to be. Rock City, you've been off the chains. I'm going to say it again. Rock City, you've been off the chains. And I'm excited about where it's going. My email, my inbox, text messages are being flooded with people saying, Pastor Mike, you own one. You're on one. We're seeing churches across the country do renditions of Rock City University, calling it summer school and this right here. And that's what we are. We want to be a champion for what God is doing. This past week, I had the opportunity of training over a thousand pastors from across the country on how to be creative and the blessing of having both hands. Somebody say both hands. The blessing of having both hands. That's so incredible. When Nehemiah was building the wall, he had to use both hands. He would have to build in one hand, fight with the other hand. I'm going to talk to this side. He had to build in one hand and fight in the other hand. I'm already preaching. If you're going to be you, somebody type, shout, be you. You have to be versatile with both hands. You have to be versatile with both hands. Make that make sense. You might have to be anointed on one hand, but a grinder on the other hand. You want to know the thing that makes me so mad with Christians when it comes to favor? You think favor is an excuse for you to hustle. And I say the word hustle not from a scam point of view, but from the point of view of putting in some work. See, see, to use both hands means I'm comfortable in the mountain and the mud. Can you put that in your notes real quickly? Mountain or the mud. That's good, ain't it? Mountain or the mud. Mountain, I can be administrative. Mud, I can be a dog. Somebody shout, I'm both. And it's the ability to use both hands. And today in this particular text, I think it's something that's critical that we have to examine. If you're going to be all that God calls you to be, number one, you have to be versed in both hands. I want to speak a blessing over your life that you will be uh, anointed enough to prophesy, but intellectual enough to close the deal. Both hands. See, she caught that. You smile, but you ain't throw your hand up and say, I received that. I'm going to say it again. Anointed enough to prophesy, but intellectual enough to close the deal. Anointed enough to get a prayer through, but then paid enough to pay cash for whatever you want. Somebody shout both hands. It is not either or. As a matter of fact, I need 300 people to put the hands up in the comments right there, which means at Rock City, that might be the new shirt. Just hands up, which means both hands. When I say hands up, you shout both hands. Hands up, which means I'm saved and paid. Hands up. I can pray and strategize. Hands up. That means I'm gifted wherever I go. It is not either or. It is what? Both and, and if you're going to be skilled and versed enough to be all that God is calling you to be, I want to say something, three words that is going to, rev- I want to say it better. I want to say three words that will revolutionize your life today at Rock City University. Are you ready for these three words? Are you ready for these three words? Here it is. Deal with it. There are some things, Tiffany, you're going to have to deal with. In John chapter 16, verse 33, it starts by saying NIV version, I have told you these things so that in me, that'll tear church up, won't it? You may have peace. In this world, you will have trouble, but take heart. I have overcome the world. Rock City University, here's our big idea of the week. 
put this all over social media. As a matter of fact, get your phone ready. Go ahead and tag me at Pastor Mike Jr. at Rock City B. Ham. Here's the big idea for the week. Are you ready? It's the pain of being you that creates the power of being you. It's the pain of being you that creates the power of being you. We will all go through a series, put this in your notes, of adversity and hardships. Look at what the text says. In this world, you will have trouble. And all of us will go through a series of adversity and hardships that shape who we become. Now, I want to sit there for a second because I want to say it slowly. I want to say it slowly. And Dre, I want to put some pressure on you right quickly. If you don't mind, I have something right here under the table, under the table. All right, there it is right there. There it is right there, okay? You see that right there? It is just a floating blah. It is a floating blah. It is full of potential, but it has not been molded. It is a, you see it right there. It is a floating blah. We don't know what it's going to be. If you look at it right now, and I told you to put in the comments what you're looking at, you don't know what you're looking at because it hasn't been processed or molded or shaped. And what God is saying, all of us come out the womb looking like blah. For I know the plans, the molding that I have for you, saith the Lord. All right, well, here's this critical. So what happens? He says, adversity and hardship. So do me a favor. You see my blah. So give me some adversity. There it is. And give me some hardship. So let me show you what happens. He takes the adversity and the hardships. He combines it with you. And it molds you. And what you come out to be is something eyes have not seen and ears have not heard. Now, everybody's watching the stream now saying, I had no idea all of that was in this, but it was in the right hand. See, what I'm trying to get you to realize is if you're going to be you, somebody say be you. It's about who you allow to shape you. I need the right people in my life to shape me. Put this in your notes. The shaping is determined by whose hands you are in. Oh, that's rich, ain't it, Kurt? Kurt, if I throw you a basketball, that basketball is about, it's worth about $20. Kurt, if I throw you a basketball, that basketball is worth $10, $15, $20. But if I put that same ball in LeBron James' hands, it's worth a billion dollars because his hands determine the worth of the ball. If I put a pair of golf clubs in your hands, James, it may be worth about $20. Put that same pair in Tiger Woods' hands. It's worth multiple millions of dollars. Can I ask you a question? Did the ball change? Did the golf club change? What changed? The hands. I'm going to give you another one. If I put ingredients for Sunday dinner in some of your hands, it may not be worth nothing. But if I put that same ingredients in Big Mama's hands, it can feed everybody in the family. Why? It's not about the product. It's about who's what? Hands. What if I told you you've been assessing your life the wrong way? You've actually convinced yourself you're not a good spouse. What if you are a good spouse? You just in. Now, I'm not giving you any credence to go leave nobody and do nothing. What I'm trying to get you to realize is before you pick the next person you date, you might need to look at their hands. Show me what you produced. Show me what you molded. It is the adversity and the hardships that shape us. But it's how well we handle the adversity that shapes our identity. It's how well we handle the adversity that shapes our identity. Look at James 1, 2, and 4. Consider it pure joy. Oh, that's church. My brothers and sisters, whenever you face trials of many kinds, because you know that the testing of your faith produces perseverance. Let perseverance finish its work so that you may be mature and complete, not lacking anything. I'm going to say this and I don't want you to shout if you're running from adversity. But for those of you who've been sitting in your mess and sitting in the different trials, adversities, and hardships that you've been in, I want to speak over your life. When you come out of this, oh my God, you won't lack nothing. I'm going to say this and I need a hundred people to type it. What's your word for the rest of this summer? No lack. I need somebody to just type no lack. 
Look at your neighbor and just type no lack. No lack. When I say something, you just shout no lack. When it comes to my money, no y'all don't even know when to have church. When it comes to my peace, no lack. when it comes to my emotional stability, no when it comes to my circle winning, no when it comes to my anointing, no when it comes to my favor, When it comes to what I need God to do in my life for the next 10, 15, 20, 25, 30, 35, 40, 50 years, you ought to shout, no lack. I lack nothing. Pastor Mike, I got bills behind right now. Yes, I do. But you better believe I may not have all the money, but I've never seen the righteous forsaken, nor his seed begging for bread. I speak over your life, no lack. That's critical. It's because of how well we handle adversity. Put this in your notes. Adversity is the price we pay for advancement. Adversity is the price that we pay for advancement. If you want to move forward, you have to pay a toll called adversity. All right, not in Birmingham, but I never forget when we went to the beach. We got to the beach. They said, oh, we almost there. And Deacon Corey was driving us. And all of a sudden, we saw a bridge. And I said, okay, we got to go over the bridge. But it was something on the bridge that we don't have in Birmingham called a toll. Now, I'm sitting there tripping like, how are they going to charge us to get into the city? In that state, they make money because if you want to enjoy the luxury of my beach, you got to pay because you're a guest. I need you to catch this right here. And many of you are praying for stuff you don't want to pay the price for. Adversity is the price you pay for advancement. Pastor Mike, I want to go to another level. How much does that level cost? Tristan, I heard you pray. This is why you got to be careful when you want people's gifting and anointings. Tristan, I heard you pray and you pray heaven down. You don't know how much that costs. All right, I went, on, I went on a website not too long ago, and I was bored. I started building a car. Have you ever did that before? You went on Mercedes or somewhere, you just start building a car. I started building a car, and I got slick. I said, that car don't cost but 35 I'm going to get that joint. But then all of a sudden, they said, build it. So I said, no, I want the leather seats. Boom. Then I wanted the entertainment system. Boom. Then I wanted the, the rims. Boom. Then I wanted the sunroof. Boom. Then I wanted the seat belts to do so-and-so. Boom. Then I wanted the red spokes on it. I got through. That joint was almost 110 I was like, the devil is a lie. They said it was standard. But now realize real quickly, if you want a standard model, it's one price. But if you want it fully loaded, it's a different price. I am not trying to be arrogant or funny, but I don't want a standard anointing. I don't want standard favor. I do not want a standard blessing. Here's your word. Give me the fully loaded version of what I'm praying for. And if I got to pay the price, let me pay the price because adversity is the price you pray pay for advancement. Somebody shout out, pay the price. Jesus went to Calvary to save a wretch like you and me. That's the price. See, if you look at it like that, everything changes. I don't want you to understand is stop playing for stuff you're not willing to pay the price for. Because when it comes to advancement, put this in your notes. When it comes to advancement, you cannot get a cosigner. You can get a you can get a cosigner for the attack, but you cannot get a cosigner for the advancement. So when you have to get a cosigner for the attack, all right, you survive it, but you don't thrive from it. When you gain the strength to endure it yourself, that's when God knows you're ready to be advanced. And there are two types of adversity. Put this in your notes. External adversity and internal adversity. External adversity and internal adversity. Somebody say external. External adversity is when it's me versus my enemies. X. External adversity is when it's me versus my enemies, while internal adversity is when it's me versus myself. Wow. Michael. External is when I got to deal with them. Internal is when I got to deal with 
me. And you want to know why most of us fail? Because we love getting teammates for them. But we don't like having people deal with us, which is why when they attacked you, you survived it. But the reason you didn't thrive is because you won the war against them. You lost the war against me. Did you catch what I just said? And avoiding short-term external conflict will only create long-term internal conflict. Avoiding dealing with your mess on the outside, it grows or feeds the mess that's building on the inside. Everybody want to talk about haters. Don't nobody want to talk about they self. I need a hundred people to type, I need help with me. Forget my haters. Truth be told, I don't even care what they think anyway. They irritate me. The reason your haters had to clap for myself. The reason your haters irritate you so much is because they are making you realize you really have a problem with you. See, the reason the external bothers you so deeply is because you lack the strength internally. So you, when you don't deal with the lack of your prayer life, the lack of your devotion, the lack of your spiritual stability, the lack of not developing the gifts that God has put on the inside of you, now the stuff on the outside can deal with what should have been the fruit of the inside. Michael, and what if I told you, what if I told you it's important to remember that what we see as adversity, God sees as opportunity. What we see as adversity, God sees as opportunity. I might have a little church right here. The adversity of the Red Sea birthed the opportunity to become a deliverer. The adversity of Jericho's wall birthed the opportunity for Joshua to become a leader. The adversity of Goliath birthed the opportunity of David to become a king. The adversity of the cross birthed the opportunity for Jesus to become our savior. You cannot get the crown with the adversity without the adversity of the attack. So many of you are saying, God, when is it my season? When you deal with what you got to deal with right now. I'm in the wrong church. I'm in the wrong church. I'm in the wrong church. What we see as adversity, God sees as opportunity. And what if I told you, please put this in your notes. Put this in your notes. Adversity is advertisement. Adversity is advertisement. See, how you handle adversity sends a message whether you like it or not. See, when you run from adversity, you just put an advertisement out that says, you weak. You just put an advertisement out that says, if you want somebody to run over, come see them. If, if, if you want to do some stuff, if you don't think they can handle none. So this is why the devil and his demons and his minions run in and out of your life. Why, Pastor Mike? Because you keep sending out an advertisement that literally says you can't handle nothing. But when you're built for it, you put up a billboard that says, I am not the one. Look at somebody and say, I'm not the one. I'm not the one. Somebody type, I'm not the one. This is why the devil know good and well, if he come for you, he better come correct. Because though he slay me, I might have a little church, Corey, yet will I trust him. See, I only want you to shout right here, not for a new house. Hold on, Corey, don't shout for a new house. Don't shout for a new car. Don't shout because it's a promotion with your name on it. I only want you to shout if you've been dealing with your adversity the best you can and something in you wanted to lay down, but something in your spirit said, if I just hold on a little while longer, I need somebody to praise God that I'm getting stronger, I'm getting wiser, I'm getting better. It's not going to break me. It's going to make me that eyes have not seen, ears have not heard what God is developing, perfecting, and performing in my life. Somebody shout, I'm ready to deal with it. Because I see adversity as an opportunity. 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 Adversity as an opportunity. 
uh, upper, upper tune, not the op position, tuning T. So, so when I hear that word, I hear things. Op, opposition. I hear op, opposite, opposite, opposition. Something that's countercultural to who I am. But then I see tune. All right, so, so I don't know if you grew up in a house like mine uh, where, where you had a TV uh, that we didn't have cable. And if you didn't put it in the right channel, it was in between two channels. Or I don't know if you've ever been in your car and you was looking for a radio station and, and you heard a little country, then you heard a little hip hop. And it was because it was in between. It wasn't hot. It, it wasn't cold. It was lukewarm. It wasn't saved, but it also wasn't worldly. It wasn't out. But it was also not in. It had one foot on this side and one foot on that side. And in order to hear, you had to do what? Tune it. When you view adversity as an opportunity, you're saying, God, use the opposite of what I am to tune me. God sends adversity. God sends adversity as an opportunity because he's saying there is a frequency that I need you on, that blessings will never get you to. There is a frequency that I need to put you on that joy will never get you to. There is a frequency I want to put you on that the next level, if I give a sick person more blessings, it'll make them sicker. If I give an addict more money, it will kill him. If I give a child grown-up stuff, he'll kill himself. So God says, you know what I'm going to do? If I give you a blessing, you'll go too far left. If all I do is give you hell, you'll go too far this way. So I have to send adversity as an opportunity. And why is that important, Pastor Mike? Because it tunes. What opportunity has God presented to you? Or let me ask it like this. Am I missing opportunities because I keep avoiding adversity? I'm in the wrong church today. Am I missing opportunities because I keep avoiding adversity? What if I told you, I don't want to say this because I'm scared somebody may take out running. The fight is fixed. All you got to do is show. I'm going to say it again. The fight is fixed. All you got to do is show up. Can I ask you a question? Why are you avoiding what you're guaranteed to overcome. Why are you avoiding what you are guaranteed to overcome? Stop running from it. Run to it. Oh, I got to stop. In our text today, Jesus teaching the disciples who are struggling with adversity of their new identity. They are struggling with the adversity of their new identity. Jesus was constantly telling people throughout the New Testament to do what? Take heart. Take heart is an idiom, which means to become confident. Put that in your notes. Take heart. Put that on the screen for him right there. There it is. To become confident or courageous during a difficult situation. Did you catch that? Take heart means to become confident and courageous during a difficult situation. If Jesus is telling us to take heart, that must mean there's a chance that we have lost heart. And I wonder how many of us have lost heart. Or in other words, have you ever lost confidence, lost courage because of a difficult situation? And that's real. So when we say church colloquialism or church sex, we say take heart. Many of you miss it. Let's break it down and use the definition. Take your confidence. Take courage. Well, God knows I want to be all you call me to be, but I don't know if I can handle Take heart. Jesus. Think about it. We said it in the hood growing up and didn't even realize we were being biblical. You got heart. Growing up in the hood, you said what? Whenever somebody was scared... And they did something that scared. They said, man, you got heart, which means you had courage. And there are a few things to watch out for that can cause you to lose heart. If you're going to become the authentic you, here are three conflicts you can't afford to avoid. Here it is. The first thing I need you to deal with is to begin to deal with people's opinion. Yeah. You can't avoid dealing with people's opinion. In other words, do not have the mindset, this is heavy, do not have the mindset that everything critical is an attack. That's rich, ain't it? Everything critical is an attack. Put this in your notes for your pastor. Can you do this for me? Constructive versus condemning. 
I want to I wanna have some fun. Can I have a little fun? You, you don't mind if I have a little fun? Can you see me clearly, Dre? Can you see me clearly, Dre? All right, so, so, so I, I tell you what, here, here, yeah, I'll do it right here. Here, so, so, so. Okay, that, that's constructive. It means to build up. All right, build up. Hold on. All right, so condemning is to build down. So, so I want you to see something. You have what I built, which is constructive, versus what I destroyed, which is condemning. Which why the text says there is no condemnation. Condemnation. And here's the problem. When you've been around so people, I, I want to say it better. When you've been in a toxic culture of condemning, you view opinions and all forms of opinion as condemnation. When your heart has been broken, take heart. It's hard to take heart when it's broken. When your heart has been broken by negative words and opinions and, 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 dis, and disgruntled friends and haters and lies and broken promises, you view all opinions through the lens of condemnation. So if I come to you and say, if I come to you and say, Curtis, I watch your message and if I was you, I would do this a little better because you're moving a little too fast. If Curtis's heart is not in the right place, Curtis will say, man, why are you hating on the way I preach? See, because the culture told you if, there, if anybody don't like you, they're a hater. See, the world, see here, the world has taught us that anybody who doesn't agree with what you think and think you're the best thing smoking is a what? Hater. I'm going to argue a hater is somebody who won't even tell me what's wrong. I'd rather you hate what I said but love what you become. I'm going to say it again. I don't mind if you hate what I say to you. As long as you receive it, because I'm going to make you love or you're going to become, you're going to love what you become. Yeah. Love me enough for me to hate what you said, yeah. but grow from it. Yeah. Michael, oh, somebody shout, take heart. Yeah. Proverbs 29, 25. Y'all ready to have church? The fear of human opinions disable. Trusting in God protects you from that. The fear of human opinions disables. Who knows what disable means? Turns off. Turns off. It turns off. So in other words, look at what this says. The fear of other people's opinion, human opinion, it disables. Trust in God protects you from that. Give me an opinion. I've created a culture where those, if you really love me, tell me something. That's the culture I got. Pastor Mike, I love you, but you need to make a decision about X, Y, Z quickly. So and so, so and so, so. Old Pastor Mike, stay in your lane. Don't so and so, so and so. I won't even respond. Now, I love you. Here's what I'm wrestling with, but thank you. Thank you. You want to know why? I want to be better. I want to be. When you want to be, anyway, I, I'm not afraid of the process. I'm not arrogant enough to believe you need a title to develop me. Can I ask you a question? Can I ask you a question? Who taught you how to walk? Your parents? Whoever was raising you? Who taught you how to talk? You picked it up from being around your parents? Whoever raised you? Who taught you how to eat? Whoever hands you was in, yada, 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 yada. Can I ask you a question? Did they have a motor skills degree? Were they a chef? They just did the best they could. And you was young enough to receive them because they were in a place of authority over your life. Then you become an adult, and they got to have credentials. But more importantly, you got to like them. That's the real issue. You only want to be developed by people you like. When oftentimes it's the folk you don't like that's going to help develop you. Oh, my God. And fear of other people's opinion is a result of personal insecurities. That's critical. Fear of other people's opinions or people's opinions is a result of personal insecurity. Can I say that better and make the text make sense? Fear of external advice is because of a lack of internal security. And I want to say this to you. It is the ultimate sign of disrespect to God and his word. 
What comes out your mouth may be correct or it may not be correct, but it does not change what God said to me. That's critical. That's critical. Galatians 1 and 10, look at this. Am I now trying to win the approval of human beings or of God? Or am I trying to please God? If I were still trying to please people, I would not be a servant of Christ. Who am I trying to please? When I tell you I'm so free to be who I am right now, because, you know, about nine months ago, I said, you know what? I'm going to do what God called me to do. I can't get be in the business of people pleasing. You know what I discovered? While you're trying to please them and they're condemning you, they live in their life. Yeah. They live in it and care less what you think. Oh, my God. What's the next thing we got to deal with? I hope you catch this. We got to deal with the pressure. The world can only tell us how to cope with pressure, but God teaches us how to convert pressure. The world teaches us how to cope with pressure. God teaches us how to convert pressure. Nearly every time God wanted to do great things in Scripture, he put someone under pressure. The world will teach you, baby girl, how to cope. You stressed out? Go smoke some. Cope with it. You don't have a long day? Go get you a drink and take your shoes off. Cope with it. He broke your heart? Girl, go find you somebody else. Cope with it. Grandmama said the best way to get over one one is under another one. Jesus Christ. If that ain't the most toxic foolishness I ever heard in my life. Toxic. Think of it. We've been listening to the most toxic people we done ever had. You lost, a, you, you lost your toy. They said, just go get them another one. Toxic advice. Toxic advice because the world can only teach us to cope. Teach us to cope. That's all the world can do is teach us to cope. You had a bad day. I don't know about you. Just go get you something to eat. Go get you some lobster tails. Go, go get some crab legs. Jesus life. I need 10 people to just type crab legs in Jesus name. Crab legs. I want, I want to pause the message for about 10 seconds. Put your favorite cat crab leg in the comments right now. Lemon pepper. Spicy. Say it again. Alaskan king. Jesus Christ. Just go eat. Hear me, man. I almost gained 90 pounds back in the day, almost 300 pounds, because the way I dealt with the pressure, i.e. depression, anxiety, I coped with food. The world can only teach you to cope. This is worth thanking God for, but God can teach us to convert it. Now, I want to help you. Somebody say convert it. Okay. All right. I want to give you an analogy. We're in a house, right? We're in a house. And, and it's 110 degrees outside, house burning up, okay, house burning up. You turn the AC on, but what's the problem? When you turn your AC on, your power bill does what? Go sky high, go sky high. Somebody was sitting at home and said, what if we put a panel on the roof and convert it? Solar energy. So what we'll do is, I got these little lights I got from Walmart. Some of y'all got some from Walmart. And what you'll do is, you don't, have, you don't need an electrician. You don't need to run no wires. You take it out the box, pull the tape off, stick it in the ground. And then you sit there and look stupid. Don't you just sit there like, when is it going to come on? So you're like, no, because it needs it to be dark. So, so once the sunlight goes down, boom, something triggers. It converts the darkness into light. When it gets put in a certain environment, it activates. What I'm trying to get you to realize is what if God put you in that because nearly every time in the Bible that God wanted to do something great, he put somebody under pressure. If we look at Abraham, Moses, Job, Daniel, and see how God uses adversity to show his power through his people. Jesus in the Garden of Gethsemane felt so much pressure that he asked God if there was another way to do it. I told you that last week, but he said, nevertheless, he converted it. Not thy will, my will, but thy will be done. It's not the pressure itself, but how we respond to it that determines what we become it is not the pressure itself it's what we how we respond to it that makes us who we are why because pressure produces purpose pressure produces purpose like an olive the only way our anointing can come out is for it to be pressed or crushed who loves ketchup on your fries? Can I ask you a question? How you get the ketchup out? Pressure. How you get the toothpaste out? Pressure. Look at your name and say, I'm a hypocrite. Somebody just type, Pastor, pray for me. I'm a hypocrite. Because many of y'all won't go buy no more toothpaste. You got that one toothpaste. 
and you don't put that one toothpaste under so much pressure that it done got rolled up. And then once you roll it up, you can't even hold. It's so empty. You can't even hold your toothpaste and, and, and the toothbrush. You got to put your toothbrush down. And you got a squeeze. Now you got toothpaste all on the counter. And then you make sure ain't nobody looking. Then you scoop it up off the counter just to you brushing your teeth with toothpaste, leftover dirt, leftover backwash and everything because you won't go get nothing. Yet God looks at you. It says it's a little more in you. So he puts a little more pressure on you. And all of a sudden, I can't take it no more. But if you knew, Pastor Mike, I'm done. I ain't got nothing left. God said the devil is a lie. I got a little more. I want to shout and say it's a little more left in you if you just stay calm under pressure. Pressure. Why, PMJ? Because Proverbs 24, 10. 24.10 24.10 says, this is so critical, if you fail under pressure, your strength is too small. If you fail under pressure, your strength is too small. And I told you once before that a lot of people have power, but strength is developed. There's a difference between power and Strength. There is a difference between power and strength. I would say power is force. Strength is sustainable force. Power, I can get this off me. Strength, I can keep it off me. Power means, uh, I can get it off me. Strength means I can keep it off me. It's like getting up under a bench press. I got enough power. This, this is cold-blooded. What's the difference between your max and your rep? Your max is what you can do once, which is a show of your power. Your strength is what you can do consistently. And in order to build your power, you have to develop power. If life hit me hard, I can pray once. Strength, I pray often. My prayer life is strong. Did you catch that? Tristan, I pray a strong prayer life over your life. Pastor Mike, I want the power. I was with one of uh, my sisters in the Lord this week, Latrice Ryan. I love her so much. Uh, And she literally preached probably two hours at one pace, moving. Then she prayed. The way she prays is just powerful. And and I looked at it, and I looked at it, and I said, man, every woman in this room came to this conference because they want that power. I guarantee they have no clue how much she develops the strength. Jesus Christ. So number three, I want to get you out of here. We cannot avoid, we have to deal with dealing with problems. Yeah, problems. The truth is that problems have a wonderful way of keeping us humble and cleansing us from selfish ambition, arrogance, and ignorance. Wow, can I say that again? The truth is that problems have a wonderful way of keeping us humble and cleansing us from selfish ambition, arrogance, and ignorance. Now, normally, I wouldn't use ignorance because it's not an A, uh, but for the sake of today, it was beautiful. So do me a favor. Put these three things in your notes. Ambition, arrogance, ignorance. Ambition, I want it. Arrogance, I deserve it. Ignorance, I didn't know it was available. Ambition, I want it. Arrogance, I deserve it. Ignorance, I didn't know it was available. God uses problems to weed out what you want that he doesn't want. He uses problems to weed out what you think you deserve that you ain't even earned. And he weeds out problems to show you it's stuff that's available that you're too ignorant to even believe God for. I thought I needed somebody to pray with me. Send them some trouble so they can go ahead and pray. I said it once and I said it again, God, I'm, I had somebody inbox me today and I said this to him and I said I was going to say it to my church. They said, Pastor Mike, I, I keep getting these prophetic words, but it's like God not doing what he told me to do. I said, 
God is in charge of the, I'm sorry, I said God sends you a word, but you are not responsible for the definition. See, arrogance makes you think when somebody gives you a prophetic word, you can define it. God told me to tell you to prepare your heart because there's promotion with you. I I see God promoting you. And the first thing is you put a definition of, you put a clause on it. Girl, I'm getting ready. God's getting ready to promote me on my job. And you don't realize it was a promotion to another level of hell. Ambition, ignorance, arrogance. Ambition, ignorance, arrogance. I I want want you to do me a favor, and I want you to be real. We're in school, and I want you to be very real today. Ambition, put this on the screen for him. Ambition, ignorance, arrogance. In the comments or in the room or wherever you are, I want you to put, it can be rhetorical, or if you're bold enough to put in the comments, which one of these are you dealing with? Is it one, is it two, or is it three? Which one is it? All right. Which, you see it's a number at the top. One, two, three. Put your number. Somebody, oh, Lord, somebody done put one, two, three. Seven people done put all of them. All of them. Ambition. All right. I, I want to say this. Who is ambitious? I raise my hand. Don't be spiritual. Don't be over spiritual. You ain't got no ambition. Something wrong with you. I speak ambition over your life. Hollis, what's the problem with ambition? Unchecked, Unchecked ambition. The day he said that it blessed my life. Unchecked ambition. Ain't nothing wrong with being ambitious. Can I ask you a question? I, I hope I don't become a heretic for saying this. I came to save, seek and save that which was lost. Who said that? Jesus. Is that not ambitious? Is that not ambitious? Can I, okay. <laughs> Is that not ambitious? I'm going to say the word. Just give me 12. I'm going to save billions of people. But, but just give me 12 unexperienced people and I'll be cool. <laughs> hey, what you do for a living? You fish? I make you fishers of men. Ambitious. There's nothing wrong with ambition. I want to be. Be you. I want to be. The problem is you have people who want to be and want to bees. Michael. You have people who want to be and want to be. I'll put it on the screen for you. This is school, right? You have people who want to be with a T and people who are wannabes. See, a person who want to be is somebody who says, God, I am submitted to the process. And if I got to get another year of school, if I got to save money, if I got to cut stuff out my budget, whatever I have to do to become it, I will do it because I want it. A wannabe will front fake lie cheat steal to look like something that they are not and the problem with the world is y'all are going crazy over wannabes and giving up what you should be because you are impressed with stuff that ain't even real i am not a wannabe i just want to be what's the difference between a wannabe and somebody who wants to be a t The only difference between a wannabe and somebody who want to be is the cross. When you see wannabe, there is no vertical or horizontal relationship. It's about my ambition, my dream, my goal, what I drive, what I eat, where I live. When you want to be, it is saying, God, whatever you desire for me. Here it is. Watch this. Watch this. I submit my dream to God. Now, God, if it's your will, I'm going to become it. But if it ain't your will, I'm going to still thank you. See, the difference between a wannabe and somebody who wants to be is the application. When I want to be, I submit that application to God. God, I just want to be the best pastor in the city of Birmingham. I mean it from the bottom of my heart. I mean it from the bottom of my heart. God, and I don't think nothing's wrong with saying that. God, I want to be an enigma. I want to be an aboriginal. I, I want to I, I be, it was a word I heard one day, and I said, God, make me that. Um, I, I, I want to be, uh, uh, say it again? I want to be an anomaly. I want to be one of those people that God uses that you just cannot figure it out. How has this boy got the best church in the world, the best music in the world, the best kid? I, 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 I want it. Oh, my God, I want it. I need seven people to not leave me hanging and say, Pastor, I want it too. 
Oh my God, I want it to. Ain't nothing wrong with wanting it. The problem is when you want it, even though God don't want it for you. When you want stuff that he clearly said you can't have. Adam, I know you're going to be hungry. You're going to want something to eat. Only problem is you can't have that. And the devil comes to him and he comes to her and you, he trying to keep, he just don't want y'all to be like him. He don't want y'all to be. In other words, you can be a wannabe if you want to. Be whatever you want to be. Y'all don't like me today. Ambition. I want it. Even though God don't want it for me. Arrogance. I deserve it. Daniel, we got to stop allowing the devil to trick us into believing we deserve stuff. It's entitlement. Entitlement. Now, God, I've been praying for 10 years. I'm overdue. Says who? Can we do this deductively? I want to do this deductively. All right, who got a card note? Throw your hand up. All right. What card notes are what? How many months? Standard. 60 months. 60 months, which is what? Five years? Five years. Let's do this deductively. You faithful for four and a half years. The last four months, you don't pay nothing. Are they going to look at you and say, well, you know what? You've been faithful for four and a half years. So you know what, man? Go and get that car. You killed it. They, will re- they repossessed my blue Ford Focus with two payments left. Me and lady, we, like, we got, ma'am, we got two payments. Well, I'm, I'm just doing the paperwork. You want to know why? They didn't care. But yet you arrogant enough to believe just because you've been praying for 10 years. Let's do this deductively, okay? So the blessing you want from God, you got to be faithful for 2021, okay? 2021. All you got to do is be faithful for 2021. But then you acted a fool in February, slept with them in March, was cussing and acting a fool. Then the moment outside opened. It's hot girl summer now, right? Outside open, all of a sudden, now it's hot girl summer. It, 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 didn't it get cold? Now it, it, it's cuddles. It, so, so, all of, so now you go to heaven and say, but I prayed this whole year. Or did you pray 20 times? So let's say you pray, let's say you pray twice a week. All right, twice a week, two times, 52 is what? 104. So you got 104 days of praying. Out of 365 days, what's that percentage? What grade is that? That's 30%? That's 30%? Which means your grade for the year would be a F? Yet you standing in my office telling me what my degree? I ask you to pray three times a day for a quick second. When you wake up, set your alarm at 11.55 and before you go to bed. I want to help you real quickly. God don't even mind you making an F in man's eyes because you'll make a hundred in his eyes. If I only do 10% of my work, my teacher give me an F. God said, if you give me 10%, that's a hundred. Catch what I just said. But for the sake of conversation, can I argue with you? What made you think you deserved it? My best is a Filthy rag. Now, I don't see most of y'all rich. Most of y'all rich and wealthy. And y'all watching me, I got a whole lot of millionaire members. So everybody who's watching, look at all them hands say he's talking to me. This this a million. That's all the million. Look at you. Ooh, look at y'all right there. All the millionaire members. But to my, my hood, ratchet members like your boy who from Central Park. And you remember what a dirty rag looked like? Remember going in the bathroom, all of a sudden there'd be a little rag in the corner? Then you got to make a life decision. So you think if you just run a little hot water on that thing, you just look like, you know what, uh, that dirt is crunchy. Who done ever seen a crunchy rag? It, it's crunchy, and you look at it, it's some soap stuck to it. Who done, it's, it's, it ain't talking about good soap. Oh, you better find out who who it. Broken pieces of soap. Like five different broken pieces of soap on it. You got to, he said, that's your best. So if my best is filthy. My worst. We want faith that fixes our problems. God wants faith that changes our life. 
Oh, my God. Think about it. And I mean it's from the bottom of my heart. From the bottom of my heart. When you're going through trial, you just got faith to make it out. God said, I wish you had faith for it to make you. That's critical. Why, Pastor Mike? Power is guarded by problems. Our problems qualify us for more spiritual responsibility. And with responsibility comes power. I was so proud of you, Carlene, Evangelist Carlene, and I want to make sure we start saying that. As soon as we get back in ministry, I want to make sure I say that publicly. Um, going to that conference this weekend and seeing you serve, seeing you serve, it, it impressed me on levels I've never seen. To see you standing on the side and her shoe can't use running, boy, fixing her shoe. Now, most females catty, they're looking and saying, what's she doing all that for? There's another level of anointing at the feet. I'm telling you, and I saw it. I, 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 said, I said, man, what God going to produce in that baby girl, which is why you should be ready for instant attack. The way at which you serve sent advertisement. How you handle adversity, it speaks. It speaks. And I want you to know your power is guarded by problems. Our problems qualify us for more responsibility. And when I saw that, you know what I said, Carlene? We need to give her some more responsibility. She earned it. She earned that. That's critical, ain't it? Let, let's, let's go home. I want you to care. Is this good today? God promotes problem solvers, not potential. Hundred people type, I'm a problem solver. He promotes problem solvers, not potential. I want to say this quote that I heard Mike Murdoch say, and I'll share it with you guys. He literally said it was a 3 a.m. in the morning, I was up, and he came on like BT or something. I never forget, probably 16. I never forget it. He said, look at me, the person who's watching right now. And I look, he said, look me intently. You will be remembered for the problems you caused or the problems you solved. He said, you get paid in life because of the problem you chose to solve. He says, you get paid for this because you decided to solve a trash problem. He said, but that person got paid a certain level because he decided to solve a legal problem. Want more money? Solve a better problem. I never forget that. Find what's broken, solve the problem, it'll get you to another level. All the heroes of the Bible are problem solvers. When God had a covenant problem, he called Noah. When he had a competence problem, he called Abraham. When he had a complacency problem, he called Joshua. When he had a capacity problem, he called Job. When he had a connection problem, he called Jesus. When he had a corruption problem, he called the Holy Spirit. And when your family had a problem, he called you. But you'll never be it if you don't deal with it. Father, I pray in the name of Jesus the strength to deal with it. That there are areas in their life that is broken. There are blind spots. There are issues that they still haven't solved and stuff that they're running from. God, give them the strength to deal with it. God, you said in your word that we can do all things through Christ with strength in us. You told us, God, in John chapter 16, verse 33, that in this world we will have trouble. But if we take heart, which means to have courage, I have overcome the world. Give us the strength to deal with it. In Jesus' name, amen. Look at John chapter 16, verse 33 with me. I want to read it one more time. He says, in this world, you will. Underline, you will. Let's go all the way together. Leslie, I want to show them how to look at a text. So I'm going to underline certain things for you and help you, okay? I, underline I, have told you, underline you, these things so that in me, underline me, you, underline you, may have peace, okay? So he's telling you right now, I have a job and you have a job. In this world, you, underline you, will have trouble. But take heart, I, underline I, have overcome the world. In other words, he's saying whatever you deal with here, all right, you will, I have. You will, which is future, I have, which is past. Watch this, which means, Darius, Darius, come here real quick. I need you to stand 
I need you to stand right there, D. I need you to stand right there. I need you to stand right there, okay? All right, if you can put, stay right there. Put the camera on D. That's you. That's you, okay? God says, while you're coming to it, I've already walked through it. You missed it. You missed it. You missed it. So, so I want you to catch this. I want you to catch this. I want you to catch this. No matter what, Darius, I want you to walk straight. Take a couple steps back. No matter back. No matter what, you will have trouble. The trouble, wait, the trouble is in front of you. Go back. The trouble is in front of you. It's already in front of you. I want you to catch this. But God says this is not simultaneous. It's not simultaneous. I'm, I'm not. I hope you catch this. There are going to be times where I do this. No, 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 no. Go, go around. But he says, no, no, no. In certain seasons, it ain't no conversation. You need this adversity. He says, so what I do is, no, no, no. Keep walking straight. It's going to nick you. But I already overcome it. I'm not going to remove it. I may just move it. See, remove means I don't have to deal with it. Move means it'll still be there. Pastor Mike, that ain't biblical. You should be like a tree. Planted by the rivers of water. Which means when life comes, you bend, but you don't break. Look at me. God told me to tell you to deal with it. You got the strength. And let me be very real with you. I want to be a balanced pastor. You may not even be strong enough to deal with it. For some of you, this may be a futuristic word. Don't listen to me today and try to go deal with something you haven't prepped for. You don't cook Thanksgiving dinner on Thanksgiving. You prep it. You go buy it. You take less. So hear me when I say this. This word for many of you may be the preparation. Pastor Mike, I'm ready. So how? start coming to devotion every day. I want to say this, and I mean it from the bottom of my heart. Many of you have stopped coming to devotion since the world opened. In the morning, devos. We call them the study hall now. Starting back in the morning. Get back on there. Get back on there. Go on the app. Listen to old. Start prepping yourself to deal with it. Right now, every morning at 6 a.m., I have to take Xander and Michael to football practice. Now, the season don't start till September. What are they doing in June? Prepping. Preparing for it. So look at me. Some of you are mature enough at this time. Deal with it. Deal with that pain. Deal with that hurt. Deal with that anger. Deal with that success. But for some of you, you may not need to deal with it today. This may be the calling that it's time to start preparing yourself to become what God called you. I love you, Rock City. I'm praying for you. Listen to me from the bottom of my heart. I believe God is preparing you for something special. Continue to pray. Continue to give. Continue to be all that God has called you to be. What's today good? Rock City, what's today good? Come on, was it good? Stand up with me. Was it good? I'm so excited. I want to introduce something called the Millennial Bridge, and I'm so excited about the Millennial Bridge. If you are looking to get your career started or to start a new one, who's looking to get your career started or start a new one? Who wants to start a new career? Put your hands up in the comments. We are excited to announce our partnership with the Millennial Bridge to provide jobs for nearly 1,000 individuals. Put the camera on me, Dre. I want to say this right now. If you want a new career or you're looking to start your career, Rock City Church, we are not, we are excited to announce our partnership with Millennial Bridge. We are bringing 1,000 jobs. Great pay. Y'all don't know when to shout. Great pay, work remote, career growth, no experience needed with one of the top software companies in America. Salesforce.com is right there on your screen. For more information, do me a favor, text jobs to 28950. Text jobs to 28950. Let's get your career headed in the right direction. Pastor Mike, why are you doing this? You can't expect people to give what they don't have. And if the only thing we're doing is trying to get you better spiritually, we're not helping with the whole man. We want to have a holistic ministry that helps you on the outside. And on the inside. Was that all right right there? Clap your hands, man. Father God, our answer is yes. Repeat after me. Say your will. Nothing more. Nothing less. Nothing else. In Jesus' name. Clap your hands. We'll see you next week. God bless you at Rock City University. Clap your hands. Wow, Pastor. Yes, 